The time having arrived, I call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order and ask you to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, it's nice to have a crowd with us tonight. We, uh, we start off each school committee meeting with hearing of visitors. That's an opportunity for members of the public to come in and speak directly with the school committee and the superintendent and myself. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet prior to each meeting if you'd like to speak to us. And tonight, nobody <coughs> signed in. So we'll move right on to the consent agenda. Our consent agenda is a block of pretty routine business that's put together uh, as one block of business to expedite keeping the meeting moving along. Uh, if any individual members of the school committee would like uh, any of the items in the consent agenda to be taken out for separate uh, discussion, we will be happy to do so. So at this time, I'll ask members of the committee if they have an agenda item that they would like taken out of the consent agenda. Mrs. Sullivan. Letter C. Letter C. Got it. Anyone else? That's it? Okay. So I'll entertain a motion on adopting the consent agenda minus item C. Motion to accept consent agenda. Second. Without item C. Without item C. Yep. Motion has been made, properly seconded. All in favor? Approved. Thank you. On item C, Mrs. Sullivan. Okay, I was just wondering, um, because it says 45 students are going, but it doesn't um, mention how many chaperones. There are four. Four chaperones? Because there's only two. Yeah, there's mentioned. always four. It's uh, Mr. Coughlin sets this trip up um, through my office every year. This is probably his at least 15th year doing this trip. Okay. Um, and as he always has four chaperones, I always provide the bus for the kids. Okay. Last year, unfortunately, it had to be canceled due to a bad weather day. Um, but the kids usually go have a great time. Right. So it's all, it's, that has to be a misprint. It, they, he always brings four chaperones okay. with him. All right, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Would you like to make a motion? OK, I'll make a motion to accept item C, the field trip for the science department, from the consent agenda. OK, we've got a motion on the floor. Second. Seconded, all in favor? Approved, thank you. So at this time, uh, I'll turn the meeting over to Deputy Superintendent Thomas for the superintendent's report on teaching and learning. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I want to um, invite the and welcome the Brockton High School swim and dive team here this evening to be recognized. Um, I want to ask Coach Zachary to come up, and I want to hand it over to um, Oh, Coach Policino, thank you. Coach Policino and Coach Zachary, come on up to the microphone, please. Um, welcome tonight. We want to welcome all the, the students from the Brockton High Swim and Dive Team and the coaches. And I want to hand it over to Vice Chair Minicello um, to um, recognize the Swim and Dive Team. We welcome you here tonight. Well, um, we wanted to congratulate uh, the coaches and certainly the this women dive team, you um, gave us a very exciting year. Um, the um, one thing I can just tell you, and I think all of the parents, there's a lot of parents here from uh, that, that were certainly supporting all of you, um, is this was such a special team. Um, it was a it was a team that um, really supported one another. I, you know, when you guys are uh, in the middle of a meet, I don't know if you realize this, but it doesn't matter if your uh, teammate is uh, coming in first or your teammate's coming in last. You guys support each other so much. Um, it's really nice to watch. Um, it's really special. And um, this year I was uh, so happy, as I'm sure the parents were and the coaches, and you should be so proud of yourselves to, to basically win the big three. This, um, there was a very, um, I guess, a, a bit of a, a drought, right, with respect to us winning the big three. The big three is the competition between um, Durfee, which is Fall River, uh, New Bedford, and Brockton. Um, so, so coaches, how, how many years has it been since we did so well? For the 
girls? It has been, um, I think it was my first year coaching, which was 2007, was the last time we won a Big Three championship. Um, for the boys, we don't know exactly. It's somewhere between 1998 and 19 and 2002. Yeah, so, so I mean, there. so that that's what's so special about this year as well. You guys won it together, boys and girls together. So um, it was really something to watch. I mean, you won the conference, and then you won the championship, which um, was was even sweeter. Um, and uh, and we basically did it uh, in in New Bedford's hometown, you know. So that was that was that was, that was incredible um, because I think they were a bit surprised, um, and we were all very proud of you. Um, the quality of um, the diving is incredible. Um, the mayor was kidding around and basically said, "Well, Mr. Minicello, uh, when he dives, it basically provides the kids with." Uh, Self-esteem and self-respect, because you know, anything after Mr. Minichello's dive is better. Is, better, is going to be better. You know, it's like a rock. <laughs> yeah, really. So, but um, uh, you know, the diving quality was incredible. Um, you could see from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. I mean, the improvement with regard to the diving, and also the same thing with regard to speed and swimming. I mean, from the beginning of the year, you guys, to the end of the year. You really came a long way. You came, you know, you really came together, and um, uh, and and again, the way um, the way you supported one another uh, at the very, I mean, you guys were in the heat of the moment, but at the end of the um, championship, when it was announced that the girls won, I mean, you guys were so you know happy and jubilant. But then, you know, shortly thereafter, when you guys knew that the boys won as well, it was like. You know, I've got it on video. It was like all pandemonia, you know. Um, it was really cool to watch. And um, I mean, we're really proud of you. Um, you know, you're a great group of kids. Um, always remember that, um, you know, supporting one another and, uh, and improving over time um, really shows in the character that you all possess. Um, this was certainly a special group. I'm sure next year uh, the group of kids that will be there um, will do just as well, but um, um, it was a pleasure to watch all of you this year. You guys really um, did accomplish a great thing, so congratulations. <laughs> you want to come up for a picture? Try to come up with the mayor for a picture. This will be good. Yeah, why don't you? Okay, yeah. why don't you, uh, the mayor and Mr. Thomas, go up for a picture with the coaches? That'd be great. Thank you so much for recognizing us tonight. It was a long time coming in. Uh, they worked extremely hard this year. This is a great group, many of them from before the four years. So thank you very much. And uh, can actually, can you just, Miss um, uh, Coach Zachary, just talk about um, how some of these swimmers have progressed when they were little through the program that, you know, in terms of, you know. So most of our swimmers have come up through our um, age group, Brockton Community Schools program. Raise your hand if you were in Brockton Community Schools program. So they've been here a long time. It took a long time <laughs> to get here. <laughs> um, but some of them were Little, I ask them every year, when are you going to be in high school? <laughs> <laughs> I know I rushed some of them, but yeah. And we also have with us um, a, a legend at the high school, and that's Claire Childs, who, uh, <laughs> who, who yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, we would never get through a swim meet without Miss Child, yeah. ever. Yeah, and yes. Mr. and we can't and we can't Thank forget you. Mr. O'Neill. You know, and Mr. Brent, he's always there uh, as well, helping out this group and the team. Um, so we have um, some very uh, great support behind this team in terms of experience and talent. And uh, you know, I, th I think it all came together this year. It was so much fun to watch. So she trained me as an administrator. There you go. <laughs> First year. Yep. Yeah, she's the best. Yep, and we want to say thank you. We were treated to dinner tonight uh, for our celebration. So thank you. You're all welcome. <laughs> You're all very much welcome. So. All right. Thank you so
Um, the Brockton, Texas Roadhouse. I want to bring up Matt Frone and Candy Keith Fay from the Texas Roadhouse. And we want to recognize them for their ongoing support always of the Brockton Public Schools and so many of the other uh, PTAs and parent groups that work with them so closely. Uh, they're always a big supporter of the school system, uh, local PACs. Um, so we welcome them here tonight. I'm going to hand it over to... Um, School Committee member Joyce Asak, to, um, who brought this forward, and we welcome you here tonight. Thanks for being with us. Welcome. So um, I thought it was um, about time we finally brought you guys before the School Committee to acknowledge what you've been doing for some of our schools and some of our staff and teachers. Um, I have a couple of messages that were sent to me. Uh, one of them is from Michelle Bolton, our Communications Director and Jane Faroli, our Parent Engagement Specialist. Um, she's also on the Superintendent's Red Apple Awards, uh, who is also in charge of the Parent Engagement Programs. Uh, Matt and Kathy have been so generous with both programs, giving us free dinners and other gifts for teachers and parents for the schools. So thank you for always acknowledging anytime we reach out and ask for donations of some sorts um, for thinking of us and helping us try to acknowledge our teachers, our parents, and the staff when we have events and we want to thank them. Now this is near and dear to my heart, my Brookfield PTO. <laughs> so um, I had one of the um, PTO members prepare a little message for you, um, and this is coming from our Brookfield PTO. The Brookfield PTO would like to extend our sincere appreciation for Matt and Candy at the Texas Roadhouse in Brockton. For all they do for our community, they have gener generously offered vouchers and coupons to celebrate every accomplishment that our students have achieved. Their support shows our students that members of our wider community recognize how hard they are working in school. They also provide the same level of support to our staff and teachers. Anytime we tell them about a staff member who has gone above and beyond for our students, they joyously share in recognizing them. We are so very grateful to have met Matt and Candy and to have such a wonderful community-minded business within our community. So I've, I've attended fun runs, I've attended different fundraisers at the Brookfield and you know Texas Roadhouse has always been a number one supporter helping us acknowledge the students. Um, so I just want to say thank you and I know there are so many other schools that I, I wish they would take, take part of what you're offering. Um, you know, bring them in for dine-in nights and things like that. So if you can just mention a few different things that you, you offer some of the schools uh, and tell us a little bit about this specific Texas Roadhouse, which is in Brockton. Thank you all. Um, 
Texas Roadhouse is very community minded. Um, we're at the Brockton location and the Brockton schools obviously are, you know, one of our number one priorities. We know that there's um, a shortfall in the schools and we want to help you guys. You know, we have school supply drives. We do back up backpack giveaways, but we also offer fundraising opportunities like our dine-in nights where, you know, the Texas Roadhouse belongs to your school that night. I like to call them spirit nights. We ask our staff to dress in your school colors or your school t-shirts or whatever you have. We decorate it in the school colors. Uh, we really make it a big deal. We want you to feel like that you are the priority, that you are in our hearts. We want you to have a good time. We want you to know that, you know, we appreciate you. Um, we do gift card fundraising. Um, I do a couple of funky little things that other places don't do. Um, I have a jail and bail, so you can put your principal in jail and have them uh, raise money throughout the community. Um, you know, we're just always just trying to look out. Um, we do certificates for student recognition, teacher recognition, staff recognition, um, bookmarks. Reading is so important, so we have bookmarks, and you know we. We just want to help. That's all we want is, is we want to reach out and help our community in every way possible. Um, one thing I just want to say, I appreciate you all inviting us here tonight. Um, one of the big things is Candy touched on it. This is our community. Roadhouse is a big company, but we're in Brockton. This is where we will be and we plan on being and plan on staying. So whatever we can do to help through the programs, I know Candy handed out some uh, stuff for you all to take a look at, but we're open-minded too. All right, something's want, want more, not working, something's working. Some for the Brookfield School might not work for another one. So uh, please uh, go back, let your, uh, everybody know that we're willing to, to try different things, try new things to help out the community. Um, we're here for a reason. We want to be here. We're in Brockton. We love the city. So we want to make sure we're helping out and uh, stay in a great community partner. All right? And I am. So it's was, wonderful that she's was, giving back. And, and I'm a Keith, so um, I'm born and raised in Brockton, class of 1985. Um, and I like to just let everybody know, you know, we're not a one and done. If the school needs us one week and they need something else the next week, we're not a one and done company. We are fully invested in our community. And, you know, we just want to be here for you, okay? So if you can all reach out to your PTOs, PTAs, and see if um, we can somehow, this is free. Um, as far as bringing attention to our different schools to help us um, get some money in for different programs that they might have going on. But to reach out to Kathy and to, um, to Matt, and um, thank you. And I think the one thing that oh, I really want to say, it's okay. <laughs> um, one thing that I want to say, I know that um, with the parents um, and, and with, with everybody, fundraising becomes very overwhelming. And I think Joyce can attest to the fact in the Brookfield PTO is I make it easy. I really do all of the work for you. We incur the cost for the flyers. We take care of these things for you. We're not going to ask you to take money out of your pockets to promote your fundraising. We take care of that for you, and I do it happily. And often, and you know, we just want to make it easy for you. So I, you know, I implore you to definitely reach out and and have people talk to me because I'm always available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you so much for having us. Oh, you've got the sliders. Pork sliders. We have a certificate for you. Yep, and they also have some pork sliders that they brought in. No, I'm good. No, no, I can. Oh. Okay, let me put you guys in the middle. So we have a uh, certificate of recognition for the Roadhouse uh, from uh, both the city and the school department. Uh, and it uh, reads certificate of recognition to the Texas Roadhouse Brockton. And thanks for the generous support of managing partner Matt Frome and store marketer Candy Keith Fay, community partners who routinely go above and beyond to support the Brockton Public Schools staff, students, and family. And this is uh, co-signed both by Superintendent Smith and myself. And it's a pleasure to present this to you. Thank you very much. Bruce. All right. There you go. Got it? Thank you. All right. Thank you, very Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So even though we're, before, we've got to give you a plug before you go. So next Monday night, the Brockton firefighters have got a fundraiser at the Roadhouse to benefit 
uh, the Historical Society of the Fire Museum, the 12th. Okay? See you later. See, he finally came up with something I know something about, <laughs> Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Only took us eight years. Yeah. Go right ahead, Mr. Thomas. All right, thank you. Um, next, we'll go to our student representative report, Sharma Race. So if you can give us an update what's going on at Brockton High and anything else in the district. Definitely, I would love to. So um, what's coming up in like the drama department is a semi-final drama festival, which should happen next week, I believe. And um, also, we've been talking a lot about um, what happened in Florida in school. And um, I know s student council and peer mediation organized um, a presentation for a sixth period on March 14th instead of doing it earlier in the morning since we do have so many people at the school. And, um, and I know that that's being organized, but something about it is like sh um, the person who's organizing it wants to get all like the club members or a representative of all the cl club members to come together and say that this is a really important cause that we all have to look at. And um, students that may not um, support the cause, they can stay in like the cafeteria, I believe, but everyone can come together. It's either on the field or in the auditorium. Not sure yet, in the field. Um, and also, on that topic, um, we did have a moment in class to kind of talk about it, um, talk about safety in the school, and that was really helpful. But what I really liked was that in the clubs that I'm a part of, almost like every teacher said, oh, let's take out time to talk about what you guys feel need to be talk about, um, talked about, like voice your opinions if you have any on the topic and just like so they can reinforce how to feel, how to make us feel safer in the school, which I thought was really good. Um, also, there has been an apprenticeship offered at Brockton High, which is like the first of many for um, with Massachusetts Life Science Center. And that is, it's kind of a entryway into doing lab work in, um, for people who want to pursue science as a career. It's a paid apprenticeship, which is um, $500 in the end. And I believe it's around six weeks. So it provides um, students a way to learn the basics of being in a lab, like the pipettes and um, the swabs with the bacteria and, and all the fun stuff in the brand new um, science lab, which is fun. And um, it can also open doors for you to get um, a summer internship with at um, probably in Cambridge. They have different locations, but with Massachusetts Life Set Science Center, which pays around like $3,000. And it really helps you um, if you do want to go into science careers. It helps you because you already have experience in the lab. You know what to do, and it's not like your first time. Um, also, March. March 19th is when summer tryouts are going to begin. So excited for that. And I'm pretty sure, oh, spring, not summer. Uh, my head's all the way. <laughs> I know. And uh, on the topic of sports, boys basketball team semifinals happening right now, or in a couple minutes. So excited for that. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's all. That's it? Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next, I want to bring up for our first pres presentation, I want to bring up the coordinator of the Adult Learning Center, Kathy Quinn. Um, she'll come up and she'll introduce her team. Um, the executive team had the pleasure of visiting the um, Adult Learning Center last week to see the wonderful things that are going on there. Uh, I also want to con commend the city, the mayor, the school committee um, for the continued support of the Adult Learning Center. That's something that's, um, that's always been important to Brockton uh, for the community. Um, and we visited last, I think it was last Wednesday, um, and it was it's just a great, it was great walking around and, and introducing, uh, meeting the students, meeting the uh, teachers, and some really great things going on there. So 
I invite everybody when you get an opportunity to take a moment to go over to the Adult Learning Center and, and visit. So Kathy, we'll hand it over to you and then we'll get out of your way so you can make your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kathy Quinn, and I'm the coordinator of the Adult Learning Center. I'm here with Noreen Jujio, who's the assistant coordinator, and Kelly Young, who is our technology coordinator. So we can say thank you very much to Kelly for putting this Prezi presentation together for us tonight. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the support that Mayor Carpenter, Superintendent Smith, Assistant Superintendent Thomas, the school committee, and Claire Childs tonight, who is the chairperson of our advisory board, is here to provide us with support. As I look around, I know that many of you have attended our award ceremonies and shaken the hands of our excited graduates and listened to their stories of survival and success. Your presence demonstrates the understanding that hard work and commitment are necessary to graduate while working full time, attending school, raising a family, etc. I would like to recognize the Brockton Public Schools executive team who came to visit us last week. Their support has been key as the Adult Learning Center has grown to become one of the largest and most well-respected providers of adult education in the state of Massachusetts. Our plan tonight is to um, give you a quick overview of the Adult Learning Center and help you understand the educational value, the economic value, and the social value that we bring to the community. Since 1972, the centers provided adult education to those who want a GED or a high set, as well as those who want to improve their English language skills. Over the years, we've expanded our classes to include citizenship, pre-K classes, family learning classes, English for employment, certificate programs such as OSHA, Serve Safe, and CPR, and also distance learning. And I'm going to take a moment to um, just explain this chart to you. Last week, when the executive team was there, we presented this to them. And they said it gave them a really good feeling for what we do at the Learning Center. And they suggested we go over it quickly with you tonight. So it's basically a flow chart of from when a student starts at the center, which is down at the very bottom, to um, when they graduate and go on to college or training programs. So students essentially come into the program, acquire about the services, and they're given a date for an assessment. Then they take a placement test. And then um, they are put on our waiting list. When an opening arises, they're placed in class. And then they go to one of two pathways. They either go to our ESOL pathway, which is on the left. And those would be students who want to improve their English language skill. After they take the initial placement test, they're placed in either a beginning, an intermediate, or an advanced ESOL class. If they come to us with a a high school equivalency degree from their own country, then they would leave our program and go on to community college or a certificate program. If they finish the advanced ESOL class but don't have a high school diploma from their country of origin, then we welcome them over into the right side of the chart, which is the high set chart. And again, they would come in and be placed at either a beginning, um, a pre-high set, or a high set level. Once they achieve their high school equivalency degree, um, they would then go on to community college, further employment, or training or certificate programs. Right now, we have about 474 students at the Learning Center. They come in the morning and in the evening. Among the population we serve, the reputation of the Adult Learning Center is such that we have a waiting list of over 700 students at the moment. So we are extremely fortunate um, to have 29 highly qualified teachers who work at the Learning Center. We have six full-time, one half-time, and 22 hourly teachers. They're all licensed by the Department of Education, and many have advanced degrees in their discipline. Several of our hourly teachers are full-time Brockton Public Schools teachers during the day who choose to work with us two nights a week. We have former principals and department heads from Brockton who have decided to join our team as well. This close association that we have with the Brockton Public Schools 
enables us to serve the community of learners in Brockton in a variety of ways, including research has shown that the best indicator of a child's success in school is the education level of his or her parents. We teach the parents of over 700 Brockton Public School students. And you know when you teach a parent, you teach a child. As part of our collaboration this year with K through 12, we are going to be teaching the parents how to use the Brockton Public Schools online portal so they'll be able to check their children's attendance, um, grades, etc. And our hope in doing this is that they'll become more involved in their children's education and they'll also increase their digital literacy skills, which we know are essential if they're going to go on to college um, or even if you're going to apply for a job nowadays, it's all done online. Um, our curriculum is the College and Career Readiness Standards for Adult Education, and they are a verbatim subset of the Massachusetts K through 12 curriculum framework. Our parents and children are learning from the same set of curriculum standards. Professional development is at the heart of our ability to provide our students with the tools to become productive and contributing members of society. And so like all Brockton Public School teachers, teachers at the Adult Learning Center participate in professional development offered through the schools and through nearby educational institutions. And they're also evaluated using baseline edge. And this helps to ensure the integrity of our program and our teachers. Thanks to the support of the Brockton Public Schools, we are a highly valued partner of adult and community learning services. We have one of only five family learning programs in the state of Massachusetts. And one of the cutest things during our day is seeing these pre-K children in our building. They bring life and energy to the staff um, and to the building itself. Their parents attend school four mornings a week. They leave school to go home, prepare dinner, and work the 3 to 11 shift and get up and do the same thing the next day. So our students are nothing if not industrious. The advent of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act has placed a renewed emphasis on workplace education, which became a priority once again when a portion of the adult basic education funding was transferred from the Department of Education to the Department of Labor. So one of the most exciting ventures for the Adult Learning Center began when we received an integrated English literacy and civics education grant. And through this grant, we've been able to offer concurrent contextualized education in the healthcare field. We've partnered with local businesses, including Associated Home Care, the Academy for Healthcare Training, Bay Point Nursing Home, Brockton Area Workforce Investment Board, and our One Stop Career Center. 27 unemployed or underemployed students at the center became certified home health aides um, and are now gainfully employed. Our first CNA program began in January of this year and the students should finish in May, take the exam, and hopefully become contributing members of our community uh, before the summer is over. We've also requested money from the Department of Education to partner with with Massasoit Community College to offer an ophthalmic assistant program in the fall of this year. Um, it's an excellent job training program with high employment opportunities and a very substantial starting salary. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that we receive that funding. So not only are our students um, busy getting jobs and attending classes, raising children, and caring for their aging parents, but they're also making time to contribute to the community. Each year, the Adult Learning Center staff and students spend an entire day cleaning the inside and the outside of the Payne School. Uh, even the pre-K children help by planting bulbs around the trees out front and around um, the garden. Kem Thompson um, supplies his ground crew, crew and the tools, and the Adult Learning Center provides the labor. During the cleanup day in 2016, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the George S. Payne School, and Mayor Carpenter issued an official proclamation declaring May 23rd Adult Learning Center Day. So you will be proud to know, I hope, that the Adult Learning Center maintains Tier 1 status with the Department of Education.
Tier 1 status is awarded to programs with the highest level of performance in the state. Programs perform performing at this level receive increased flexibility in terms of their funding and also less oversight of the day-to-day -day operations. In FY17, um, Brockton Adult Learning Center was one of five programs in the state to receive a perfect score on their mandated performance measures. So hopefully you've seen through this overview and the materials that we provided in those red packets that we are in fact delivering educational value through the programs and the classes that we offer, economic value through the job training programs and the job placements that we make, and social value through our contributions to the community. Um, we believe that Brockton is better because of adult education and we stand very proud to be part of the Brockton Public Schools. Um, we are a community that takes care of people from pre-K all the way up through adult education. So I'm going to turn it over and Noreen's going to give you some more details and then Kelly as well. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, one of the important parts of the Adult Learning Center is parent involvement, and as Kathy mentioned, the Adult Learning Center is a perfect example of that. The children go to the BPS preschool on site, there is a BPS pre-K curriculum and teacher, and the parents have their regular academic classes, but we also participate in parent and child activities together at least two or three times a month. In addition, we have other programs that the parents are, uh, uh, use. We partner with the Raising a Reader program where the parents bring home book bags every week with age-appropriate books, share those with the preschool children and the rest of the family. We also are very lucky to work with the CFCE, the Coordinated Family and Community Engagement Joni Blocks program. She gives us wonderful additional programs. For example, uh, she provides STEM workshops for our families and children. She facilitated a field trip to the Easton Children's Museum and provided workshops this month on understanding your child's behavior. The head start that these three and four year olds get um, has had very positive outcomes. A couple of examples of that is I like to think of the family learning program almost like the legacy school like Milton Academy or BBNN because I have parents that come to me when they're pregnant and my waiting list has pregnant women on it and women with one-year-olds that want to be on the list because when their child turns three they want to be in that program. Um, I anecdotally ran into one of my preschool children who's now in fifth grade at the pain at the plough across the street and she said Miss Noreen you know who's in my class and she ran through all these kids in the tag program with her that were our children so we're really happy about that in addition to the family learning program we also have a family connections class and that's for parents of school age children so the children aren't on site but they have a regular academic program, but we also try to supplement role-playing parent conferences, how to read the newsletters, what does that form mean that you got home that you're not really sure what it means. So we want to make sure that they have that support. We also have a terrific volunteer program. The volunteer program has been in place for over 30 years at the Adult Learning Center. Statewide, most adult uh, programs have volunteers that stay for one or two years. We have volunteers that have been with us for 20 years, most people five, six, seven years. They supplement and enhance the classroom learning and do one-to-one -one tutor tutoring or also work as classroom assistants. Some are retired teachers who bring years of expertise and experience to our students. Some come from the business world and bring their expertise to our students and contribute their insights, their experience. We also have a great new program that we're really happy about. It's an exciting new program that was initiated just this past school year. It's the Ambassador Program. We're all aware of how overwhelming it is to come to orientations or come in to register for class. We're dedicated to making all of our students feel welcome and in order to achieve that we started this Ambassador Program. We have a group of students who volunteer their services to translate and to welcome new students. We have ambassadors from all major language groups and these volunteers, these ambassadors volunteer their time to make students feel comfortable. 
We have students that come in the morning and the evening to help, and this program has been a real success. And these students are so eager to help others and share their experience and certainly make the process of coming in more welcoming. Civic education is an important part of the Adult Learning Center's mission. We have citizenship classes in the mornings and in the evenings, in the fall and in the spring. Students prepare for their citizenship exam, for their interviews, and the teacher helps them fill out the application for citizenship. And we also encourage our students to be involved in the political process. We set up computers at election time so they can check their polling places so they know where to vote. We help students register to vote. We empower students to become very active in civic affairs, and the students make calls to legislators when the funding for adult ed seems in jeopardy or funding for their children. I'm sure some people here have probably gotten floods of phone calls from our students. Um, advising and support services are provided as well. We're trying to help students navigate the systems they need to navigate to be successful. So we have educational counseling, advice for colleges in the area, programs, costs. We bring in speakers from Massasoit Community College, Bristol Community College. For a number of years, we bring students to a program called College for a Day, where they can go to a community college, go to attend classes, and then find out what programs are available for them. As Kathy mentioned, if we have a student, we have a number of students, they were lawyers, doctors, architects, nurses in their own country. They're here for English proficiency, but they have credentials that aren't translated. We help them translate those credentials so that they can go on to do what they're destined to do. Um, we also provide community agency referrals in terms of housing, immigration, legal services. It really isn't enough for a student to just get a high set or a GED or become fluent in a language. The goal of our advisor group is to assist the students to transition to employment, to transition to job training, or transi transition to secondary education. We also uh, have a lot of community involvement. We have a full range of services. Our adult learners benefit from programs and speakers that come to the Adult Learning Center. The fire department comes and does fire safety for the preschool. They also speak to the adults about fire safety, carbon monoxide, where you put um, we have the safety routes for your way out of the, your home in the case of a fire. The police department has sent officers to speak about traffic and driving safety, how to become aware of signs of gang involvement or drug involvement in your children. Um, we have representatives come from West uh, Wingate at Silver Lake and Associated Home Care to talk about careers in health care. And health, personal health, is an issue for our adults. So we have speakers come in, for example, to speak on mental health, depression, domestic violence, heart health, prostate cancer, diabetes. We have Walgreens comes and gives free flu shots. We also have had uh, blood pressure screenings. Uh, we give nutrition workshops in conjunction with UMass Extension, and we have a very strong partnership with the Justice Center of Southeastern Massachusetts, who gives us immigration workshops and updates that really are vital to our community. We also have connections with DTA, the Mass Commission for the Blind, Mass Rehab, Creolis Unidas, the Parent Information Center, Good Samaritan Hospital. We have a class that's been going on for years at the Career Center, at the Career Works, where we have an English for Employment class that helps students get jobs and write resumes. And these partnerships really add to the academic program because not only do we want our students to grow academically, we want them to reach their full potential as a family member, a productive worker, as a citizen. So Kelly's going to speak to some of the programs. Let's switch. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Kelly Young. I teach English to speakers of other languages at the Adult Learning Center. And uh, I split shifts, so I teach in the morning and in the evening. And that gives me a little flexibility. So I end up teaching certificate courses. Uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is really big on stackable certificates. Um, because uh, Kathy talked about WIOA, but a big part of creating a workforce is credentialing 
that workforce. Uh, so we try to get our students as many credentials and resume boosters as possible. Um, these students have completed the OSHA 10-hour general industry, and we collaborated with another department in BPS to offer this at no cost to our students. Uh, we also offer Serve Safe. The students do pay for this. It's $15. Um, the food handler course, you really can't work in a kitchen in Massachusetts without this. Um, not just restaurants, but we have a lot of students that are dietary aides in nursing homes um, and, and our schools as well. Uh, CPR. So our students, uh, we pick a few classes every year to try to switch it up so no one is forced to learn CPR year after year. Um, but they love it. It's a great class. Um, it's, it ends up being about six hours. And if at the end, if they, the students choose to, they can uh, pay for the Red Cross certificate. I believe it's, it's $5 or, or less. Um, and it's a great hands-on course. I'd feel pretty safe if, if one of my students, uh, if I was in a situation where I needed CPR, I'd trust our, these, these students to take care of me. Um, so stackable certificates of the home health aid and CNA program that we have going is a great example of stackable certificates. They start as personal care assistants, uh, sorry, homemakers, personal care assistants, home health aides, supportive home health aides, and then uh, CNAs. And these, these courses are taught, um, it's concurrent con contextualized curriculum. So there's a nurse teaching the content and we have a teacher teaching the language the students need to really master that content and then take the state licensure exams because again, uh, we're trying to get them credentials. The uh, BayWeb, the, their local plan, uh, healthcare jobs are the number one priority in the local plan um, up there with finance and uh, manufacturing. So technology, one of my hats is the technology coordinator. Um, I started the Adult Learning Center three years ago, and it looked kind of like this. You know, we just switched from overhead projectors. They, we had stacks of them in the basement. Um, we were switching to document cameras, but people were scared of them. Um, so we had a lot of professional development uh, on that, and now the teachers and students can't get enough. This is Al. This is one of our 25-year uh, veteran volunteers, and he's fantastic. Uh, if you ever need a newspaper, uh, with the, the moon landing or the Red Sox winning the World Series, he's your guy. Um, so we had about, at this, three years ago when I started, we had about 16 teacher stations, not including offices, just in classrooms, and 53 student devices, um, and maybe two, two or so printers that the students could really use. Um, now, we have same number of teacher stations, but we have 154 student devices. So we're at a one-to-one -one ratio for student to device every class period except for Monday mornings, and we're so close. Um, but you'll notice, uh, this is Joanne, a retired BPS teacher. She's got her technology cart. This is a document camera and a projector. And so she can project, project this document or what's on this computer screen over on the corner. Um, and it's, it's really seamless, it's great. These, these document cameras, they move all around. You can do 3D objects, zoom in. I think it's 12 times zoom. Um, we're really fortunate. I can't say enough good things about the tech, tech services department. Um, these students, they're, they're just in class using their tablets. Uh, last year, I, four teachers were chosen by Sabes, which is the, the organization that runs professional development in adult ed. And uh, there was a technology coordinator's coaching program pilot. So as the technology coordinator for the Adult Learning Center, I worked with one of our teachers, Dr. Jody Price. She's the, the ALC's technology, uh, excuse me, curriculum coordinator. And I worked with her to put technology objectives in at least one lesson plan in every unit so that she could share that. Um, and it's really, really taken off. Um, so you'll see here. If we came to this meeting with a poster, uh, you guys probably wouldn't think we were that great. Uh, so we're trying to get the students to do the same thing, start presentations. You see the, the poster of Chagas disease is now PowerPoint of Chagas disease and um, much more professional. You can't, you know, you, you're not college or career ready if you can't open emails or make a PowerPoint, um, even get in a webinar. Um, you're, it, you're not going to progress as as far as you can, if you, can, if you don't have those tech skills. Uh, and we follow 
loosely follow the K through 12 uh, technology standards for the state of Massachusetts. Um, so the HiSET exam is a computer-based test. And we, we like test data to a certain extent. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from it. So these students are taking a, a, a it's called Rapid. It's through Lexia. They use it in the elementary schools. Um, and practicing a computer-based test with, where it's low stakes, it's just information for the adult learning center teachers. There's nothing really riding on it. They didn't pay you know, a ton of money to take this test. It's not a high school credential. They can practice clicking, dragging, adjusting the volume. You know, how do these headphones fit? Um, because every computer, it's like when you get in someone's car, you know, where are the headlights? You know, if you, if you have those base, base skills, you, you can do it. Um, so this gentleman here, you can see he's dual devicing. He's got a cell phone and a tablet. Uh, and we encourage, encourage this at the Adult Learning Center. Uh, there's a study by the Pew Research Center. 19% of Americans are smartphone dependent, meaning their only source of internet is their smartphone, their data plan. Uh, and low income and minority uh, Americans are much more likely to be one of that 19% of all Americans. Um, just to give you a, a quick point of reference, uh, households that make $30,000 or less annually, 35% of those households are s smartphone dependent, whereas uh, at $75,000 a year in the household annually, 1% uh, is, and maybe even less than that, are dependent on their smartphones for internet. Uh, and so our students, because they're smartphone de dependent, they're four times more likely to apply for a job on their phone, access healthcare, banking, uh, finding homes, uh, government services, and take online classes than uh, people in different demographics. So Facebook. Uh, we adverti I advertise for our classes on Facebook. And if you saw some of your pictures in this PowerPoint, you can go on Facebook and take them, because they're all on Facebook, all those award ceremonies and all that. Um, so the high set course, we're always looking for um, students in our beginner high set courses. Uh, we advertise, we, we like to celebrate students. We love to celebrate when students graduate or, or have a major accomplishment, get their citizenship. But we advertise job training uh, in the community, our other classes, like the English for Employment, citizenship. Our students get priority, but we do accept you know, new students. Also community uh, events like the Brockton Public Library and Massasoit often have art exhibits or you know, authors speak that our students might not hear about uh, if it wasn't for our our Facebook page, and everyone's favorite uh, school snow days and delays, uh, we, we share those as well. So our assessments, that first one, Lexia, the logo is the one we purchased just to, for data to inform our teaching. The OWL, that OWL is the mapped, and that's for the, high, the people who are on the track to get their high set. Uh, the bottom two little logos are for English English language learners, the Best Plus and the Class E. Um, and my and so on that tier one chart that Kathy showed you, there was a, a row that said learner gains. These are the assessments. Those those bottom th these these three are the ones that determine if we're making learner gains. Um, they probably they're not used in the rest of the district. Just want you to be familiar with them. And then we have our entrance assessment. So this page is a bunch of numbers, but what it shows is we have a long waiting list. Uh, we in the high set people trying to get their high sets. We have more people on the the higher uh, reading level, and in the ESOL track, we have more people in the beginner level. We have a, we've been seeing an influx of students who have been here one, two, three months looking for for school. But you can see at the bottom bottom left, laser's not really working, uh, we have 731 students on the waiting list and 427 currently in class. Thanks, Kathy. Yep. Uh, the continuous improvement plan. So every fall, we vote on three goals for, as, as the teachers, uh, for the school. And you can see on the left, there are three teachers. Those teachers are uh, planning science curriculum for the AE track. And then you see to the right, there's just two teachers and some daffodils and tablets. Uh, and that's to represent the shift. There's been a shift. We've been, we were focusing on curriculum. And now our curriculum is really strong. It's used as examples throughout the state. Um, and we're looking into technology. The teachers are really 
comfortable with the curriculum, and we're trying to supplement it with all this technology that uh, that I have going on at the staff meetings. Uh, so on the right, you see Barbara and Denise uh, hopefully putting some technology into their lesson plans that are already really strong as it is. Uh, so the teachers this year, we voted on uh, programs and applications that can be used in the class. For example, the Google Suite, Kahoot, Quizlet, Poll Everywhere, Socrative, and those would be like um, for quizzing, making quizzes more like a game, um, vocabulary, word bubbles, that sort of thing. Um, using the tablets, we all have these new tablets with Windows 10 and, and there's a bit of a learning curve going from the, the different versions of Windows. And then Visions, which uh, tech, tech services did a great PD for us. It's to monitor your class. So if I have a teacher laptop and you all have laptops or desktops, I can see what you're doing. If you're making a mistake, I can use, I can take control of the mouse and show you where to point without running around the class and bending over. Um, it's, it's great software. We're really, we're really fortunate that BPS shared it with us. Um, next steps. On the left, you, we have Steven and Alfredo doing a FAFSA workshop with one of our ESOL classes. Um, and because if you've ever filled out a FAFSA, it's, it's tough if English is your first language. Um, so that's, we, Noreen spoke about advising, so I won't go too deep into it, but that's uh, a, a big piece of it. How do you get up that riser, you know, step to step, but wh where's, where the, the adult learning center is sort of the riser and the steps. Uh, and we encourage our students to go to transitions. There's a year free tuition at Massasoit Community College if you apply through the transitions program and then you're accepted into their courses. They're for credit unless you take the AccuPlacer and you place into remedial, um, but it's a, it's a great way for our students to get a taste of college um, and, and get some credits without breaking the bank. And on the right, we have Ruth. She graduated with her associates in nursing. She's an RN, uh, we're, and we're very proud of her. OK, so this video, we, I'm sure you've loved the pictures, but it doesn't do us justice. So we've been taking clips and wrote a script, and we have a, a short video. And after it, it's how to like us on Facebook. So please do that and stay up to date. Uh, so uh, a friend of the Adult Learning Center edited our clip, and, and this is our, our little plug. Our students come from Brockton and surrounding communities. At the Adult Learning Center, students learn, question, collaborate, research, and succeed. They become active lifelong learners who meet their personal, educational, and career goals. Education enables our students to determine their own future and to take an active role in shaping their community. For 45 years, the Brockton Adult Learning Center has offered a nurturing learning environment that is respectful of students' cultural identity and responsive to the changing needs of our students and community. Our programs provide vocational training and career information, as well as assistance in helping adult learners transition to employment, job training, and post-secondary education. Our staff, advisors, and volunteers help each student reach his or her potential. The Adult Learning Center, 45 years of service to Brockton's community, building a better Brockton. That's it. Um, I did want to know, what was the, the difference between the GED and the high set? Oh, that's a really good question. Years ago, it was called a GED. And then we think it had something to do with funding. Pearson came out with the high set, and everybody switched to the high set. And now the GED is back in fashion. So now students have an opportunity to take the GED or the high set. Is the Really a is difference? there a difference uh, yeah. in the two of them? Do you want one over the other? Does it matter? Well, it doesn't matter. They're both recognized. But um, on the GED, there are some short answers, and there's a little bit more dragging and dropping with the computer than there is on the high set. So right. right now, we've been doing the high set for the past five or six years, and all of our books are geared to that. In the next couple of years, we'll start getting GED books as well so that our students can take their pick. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. 
Well, we have over. Oh, that's a, <laughs> so it depends on where is, which class a student tests into. If they test into a beginning ESOL class, it could be up to two years. If they test into a high set class, they'll probably be in within six months. Just a minute, Shelley. Your presentation was fabulous. Thank you. Fabulous. Um, just. Uh, listening to all three of you, you can tell how much you're committed and you're basically a part of that community. Um, I, I know I was over there at, um, at a couple of the graduations with Mr. Sullivan and um, you know the, the family environment, especially at graduation time, is really special. Um, and to see uh, the joy uh, and you know for the achievement um, that uh, the graduates are experiencing and their families so excited for them uh, is really beautiful at the end of the year. Um, but um, you're doing wonderful work over there. I just want to let you know that um, it's a true credit uh, to the community. I know the mayor certainly supports you. Um, understand that you know even though uh, <laughs> You are a um, valued member of this school community. I think all of us on the school committee recognize that. And, Thank um, you. It really is. Uh, it really is special to see. And um, you know, that's the American dream. That's what this community and this country is all about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are a country of immigrants, and Brockton has been consistent. The only thing that's changed in the city of Brockton is the different countries people are coming from. Mm -hmm. But we've always been a, a, you know, a city of immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so we are very consistent. But um, you're doing a great job. Uh, the people in the building, the volunteers, the teachers, the staff, they all want to be there. Um, and you treat people like family over there. Um, Thank you. So I'm very impressed. And I was very impressed Thank you. with that presentation. Thank you. Yeah. We appreciate it. The 427, is that the max you can have there? What's that? The 427, is that the maximum amount of students you can have there? No. If we had more space and more money, we could have more students. Well, that's what I meant. Because of the space, you're limited to 427? And right now, that's what our money covers. And the comment I have was, I've been there for a couple of graduations, and it's so pleasing to go because these people, I know they work all day, or some work all night, and they're, they're like fitting it in between. It's not like the kids in high school here. And they have kids at home, you know, they're cooking meals and right. trying to work. And it, it really pays off at the end. And I'm so happy to see it. Thank you. And you three do a fabulous job. Thank Great. Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs> But I do want to say that it was eye-opening on how much you do as really a community outreach. And I think that's, that's a big part. And clearly, you have great hearts that this is, you know, you're not just providing them with an academic education. You are helping them with some real um, valuable skills. So that, that's going above and beyond. And I certainly want to thank you for that. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, next I want to bring up Lieutenant Donald Mills um, for safety and security um, training. Um, I just want to, before Lieutenant Mills starts, I want to go back in time a bit and go over some of the um, the things that have been done in the school's district over the years um, for safety and security. I think um, uh, in light of obviously the horrific shooting, another school shooting in Parkland, Florida, um, Brockton has always been above the curve and I want to also, um, and the mayor and Mr. Minicello can chime in because they were on the school committee at the time when 
Lieutenant Mills was brought over, and I know a lot of hard work was done between the school committee and the city council at the time uh, to add a lieutenant to the, um, to the Brockton Police Department staff. Uh, before that, the person who was in my position was actually running the school police, which was not uh, the best way to run a school police department with um, fully trained officers who are armed. And um, so th I wasn't the best person to be running the police department. So I know Mayor Carpenter and, and uh, Mr. Minicello uh, were a big part of that back in 2010. Uh, Lieutenant Mills was brought over to command school police. Followed by that in 2011, we received the REMS grant, emergency management grant, which was $300,000, which helped with a lot of our training, um, the, the emergency charts, the go kits. Uh, and then in 2013, um, Lieutenant Mills and I worked very closely with Michelle Streetmeyer at the Brockton Police Department, and we were able to get the $500,000 COPS grant, which um, really did a lot for the system as far as door locks, lighting, um, the FOB system that we have in the, um, uh, we got, we're able to get away with a lot of keys. Now teachers and staff have to FOB their way in and out of buildings like I do uh, with IDs. Uh, we added a lot of cameras, exterior lighting. Um, was able to provide training for Lieutenant Mills who trained not only the school police but also a lot of the Brockton police officers in active shooter training. Um, so those are the things that have been done um, throughout the year since 2010 um, and again a lot of that had to do with the training that has been done with principals um, and the, sta the teachers, um, the cafeteria workers, the custodians, the administrative assistants um, and Lieutenant Mills is going to show you some of that um, the training tonight in the presentation he, he does for parents and I'll talk about the parent forum that's coming up as well after the um, after Lieutenant Mills's um, presentation but I don't know if the mayor, uh, Mr. Minicello, wanted to jump in. I'll just say this quickly, you know, uh, the mayor and I years ago recognized that we had a very, very valuable resource here at the Brockton Public Schools, and that was the arm of the school police, and that we wanted to um, back then um, improve the force, have professionalism in the force, um, and we knew that we um, didn't live in Mayberry here in Brockton. And even in places like Mayberry, you have horrible things happen. I mean, in Connecticut, in that you know, well-to-do suburb, um, we saw what happened there. Um, but so years ago, we, we, we discussed this together. We recognized that we wanted to um, have um, a very professional and well-organized uh, wing of the Brockton Public School being the school police and that we needed a professional. We needed law enforcement to bring it to the, another level and um, you know with the cooperation with the city side, uh, the schools, we did not want to give up our, we didn't want to give up uh, control of the school police, I mean, but we wanted the cooperation and relationship with the with the Brockton public uh, with the Brockton Police Department because you know they are the professionals and you know we were fortunate to get certainly Lieutenant Mills who you know has basically done a great job um, and you know every year things improve training improves the district you know uh, we, we cannot unfortunately plan for every single horrible thing that can happen but we can at least say to ourselves we are always you know, looking over our shoulder to try to prevent something bad. Um, and um, you know, every year we want to try to get stronger. I mean, we want to, you know, we, we brought in the cameras at each one of the schools. We brought in the locks. We had a consultant go around you know, the school system in this building, you know, showing us p vulnerable points. Again, we cannot and we'll never be able to plan for every single horrible contingency, but we're better than a lot of other communities. We're certainly not perfect, and we can always improve, and Lieutenant Mills will tell you that. Times change, methods improve, but um, you know, we need to keep our kids safe, and if we can't keep our kids safe, then what the hell are we all doing here? You know, So um, it, it's a priority. It's always been a priority for the mayor. It's a priority for this school committee. It was a priority for the past school committees, um, and um, you know, we have to do what we can do in this crazy world, you know. So I'm thankful that we have a professional like Donnie Mills, and uh, 
you know, we'll just try to pray to God that our kids are, are going to be safe and our staff is going to be safe. You know? yeah. So I think it was uh, just a little over eight years ago, right before I went on the school committee for the first time, we had a shooting incident on the steps of the gym here at the high school. Mm -hmm. And it was a real <coughs> you know, I think it was, uh, it was a wake-up call uh, that um, as we debriefed and looked back at that incident that we were not prepared at that point in time and that we had a lot of work to do. And as Tom mentioned, one, a lot of great changes came out of there. Uh, the school committee was very involved working with the superintendent uh, to put an emphasis and make an investment in student safety and security and bring in an outside consultants, seek out some of the grants, grants that Mr. Thomas mentioned. And the reorganization, reorganization of the school police was a big part of that. And, and this model that we have now of having a, a Brockton police supervisor, in this case, Lieutenant Mills, uh, at running the, the school police, it, it's significantly increased the level of professionalism and training, and, and uh, it's worked out really well. I think, as I just, in the wake of Parkland, listen to some of the, the families here in the city. We've got a really tough budget coming up this year, and it's going to be you know, even tougher than last year, I think. Um, but in light of that, I still, still think we're going to have to consider uh, some investments around student safety. I don't think there's a parent of our 17,000 some odd children who doesn't think that student safety should be our number one priority. So, you know, I think we're going to have to uh, look at keeping our school police force fully staffed and maybe considering whether it's even should be staffed at a higher level. Um, yep. Oh, that's me? That was annoying the heck out of me. I was wondering who was doing that. <laughs> See, I'm even capable of annoying myself. <laughs> uh, that's much better. Yeah. So um, in the wake of Parkland, we look at school police staffing. But I think, and we're going to have to look at um, you know, our staffing of adjustment counselors and, and what we do in terms of intervention and early intervention and uh, mental health services. And you know, we're really going to have to take a hard look at some of these things and figure out how we're going to pay for them. But we have to look at them. Um, but. I think that we went from eight years ago being a school district that was behind the curve to now in recent years other school districts come here to see what we're doing. Uh, you know, there's, I don't think there's a square inch of this high school campus that's not under video surveillance. Uh, we have, we're the only community in Massachusetts that has a fully sworn, fully armed professional police department under the school system on the school grounds not school resource officers, but an actual school police force. We've integrated school resource officers. Uh, we've recently added back a fourth uh, school resource officer. We've been running with three for uh, several years now, Lieutenant Mills. And in the wake of Parkland, the chief made the commitment to increase it back to the four that we used to have years ago. So you know, we're going to all work together in, in determining uh, what where we can improve, where we can improve. So um, looking forward to Lieutenant Mills' uh, presentation. We'll get out of the way. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Thomas, school committee, thank you for having me. And thank you for the kind words. Um, following those kind words, I feel like I have to say, I hope everyone realizes that any of the improvements that have taken place over the past eight years most certainly would not have been possible if it wasn't for the cooperation of the school committee the Brockton Public School staff and obviously my staff uh, working together. This is certainly not something that we can just drop a bunch of policemen in and think it's all going to be better. It's definitely a team approach, something that has to be, uh, has to be tackled and addressed by every member of the school community from the top administrators right down to the new students coming into a new school. Everyone has to take place. Uh, that being said, thank you again for having me. This is the uh, parent forum. Uh, it is very quick. It is designed uh, not to be lengthy. I am not in the field of education, but I'm taught to do these. We want to be direct and to the point and not lose anyone in the form of death to PowerPoint. 
Um, that being said, we'll roll forward. Um, this is designed to talk about critical incidents, intruder protocols, and lockdowns inside public schools. Okay, we have to believe that reality, as Mr. Minicello said, this is happening everywhere. It's happening in cities, it's happening in rural communities. We are not exempt. Um, we need to understand it most certainly could happen here. There's a large number, it's 18,000 something, I believe, we're up to now, students in the school district, and they're all dependent on the professionals, the teachers in, this, in these buildings uh, for guidance and protection. Parents drop them off here and assume their child is going to be safe for the day. Whether they're a senior getting ready to uh, fill out college applications and decide which one they're going to go to, or they're entering school for the first time as a kindergarten student. But it's not really new to fire safe, uh, it's not really new to public safety, is it? How did the fire department address this years and years and years ago? Fire drills. No one panics at a fire drill anymore, right? They're commonplace, they're necessary, they're free from fear, and they occur all the time. The fire service has been extremely successful. There hasn't been a student that died in a fire in school since the 50s. I believe it was 1958, it was a Catholic school in Chicago. Um, and again, if the fire, drill, fire alarm went off right now, no one in this room would panic and we'd all know what to do. That's what we need to do in the form of safety drills. We have to understand there's a mindset. We have to train. We have to train ourselves, our educators, our professionals in the building, and our students, and understand that these have to be taken seriously. It's not, let's do something for a drill. We have to train in the event of a real world event. Um, an example I just recently gave was during a fire drill, no one ever sees one floor of the school evacuate and just say, okay, we'll simulate the other, other students would have evacuated. No, during a fire drill, the whole school evacu evacuates in an orderly fashion. All the steps are made by the staff members that work there and it's inspected by the fire department. That is something we have to get into the habit with with these. Unfortunately, they're happening all over the world and they, they happen quite a bit. They don't make necessarily the news the way Parkland did um, because they're just not, you know, they're small numbers, they're not quite so large. Uh, drills. The school is performing these drills. We have to understand why we're drilling. There's several things we want to look at. The school's procedures, the practices of our employees, the hardware in our building, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about our doors, the walls, just the structure and the individual readiness. You know, every single educator in the building that's charged with students in their custody for a period of time has to have an individual readiness. Okay, it's probably the most valuable thing we have is the individuals that work here, more valuable than the cameras and the locks. Okay, people are going to do what they train for in a crisis. Everyone has a fight or flight survival reaction. Some of them may not know what it is until they're put into that situation. Uh, I would like to hope that no one ever has to be put in that situation and find out, but the truth of the matter is, as was already said, we cannot plan for everything. We do not have crystal balls and we cannot predict the future. Training builds muscle memory, just like that fire alarm. If it goes off, we don't really stop and think about what to do. It is a muscle memory. If someone pulls out in front of us in a car without even thinking about it, somehow our foot lands on the brake. It's muscle memory and we want to create that type of response in an event like these. Okay, understand that we are only covering a baseline plan. We cannot prepare for every single incident or even fathom every single incident. If, you know, this was really brought apart by the shooting that took place uh, three weeks ago tomorrow. But they've been happening forever. The most one that has really struck a nerve that started a, basically a reform of how schools uh, respond to these was 1999 Columbine, and look at all the ones that have happened since then. And there was some before then, they just didn't receive the attention. Um, these have to be baseline plans. They have to be loose, they have to be flexible. Um, we can what if stuff to death. Um, there's a think on your feet clause. And you know, I'll address really the think in a, in a slide or two. Uh, terminology. When we put this in place a few years ago for us, we, we sat down, Mr. Thomas and I and a couple other people, and we said, you know, in the event of a crisis, 
it is certainly not the time to go to a flip shot at the front of the room and start flipping forward and go, okay, what are we supposed to do now? Um, we want to keep it simple. We want to keep it streamlined. And we felt we could deal with that in basically two responses, a lockdown and a stay in place. And I really have to emphasize here that lockdowns are for, you know, basically weapon-related violence or, or intruders in the building, people that don't belong or people that do belong that have created a, a, violent, a violent act. Uh, you know, you often hear on the radio or the television how a jewelry store was robbed and the elementary school three blocks away was put in lockdown. I certainly hope that wasn't the case and caused any type of panic for those poor parents or those poor children. That was, you know, I'd like to think the news editor just changed it because they knew everybody knows what a lockdown is and maybe not what a stay in place or a shelter in place is. Um, you know, a stay in place or a shelter in place. We just want to stop movement in the building. Keep in mind, your buildings are secure now. All the exterior doors are locked, right? People have to be buzzed in. No one can enter the building freely. But say there was something like that. Say, you know, people that I work with were pursuing somebody in the neighborhood of a school. We might ask that school to go and stay in place. We just want to stop movement in the building. The doors may be locked, but we know if kids aren't moving around, they won't be enticed to open the door for an adult because they, they appear at the window when, in fact, that's the adult we're looking for. When it comes to training, the teachers, uh, we are more than happy to assist with that, and I've gone to almost every school, I believe, and have, have given presentations. Um, they've been invited to join us during um, the winter recess and spring recess was when we do our active shooter training, uh, the police department. When it comes to the students, it's after these drills is the perfect time where the teachers should take some time to teach the kids that they have. They're the perfect at age-appropriate instruction, whether they're small children or high school children. Okay, the whys are not necessarily, you know, not necessarily always necessary. I understand we live in an information age and everybody thinks they have the right to know everything, but, you know, sometimes parents and adults just have to say because I said so. <laughs> and, you know, we'll explain it to you the best we can when, it's, when that time is appropriate. Um, think fire drills. It's not hard to you know, no one looks for a lot of explanation there anymore, right? Commonplace, necessary, they're fear free. They happen all the time. Lockdowns. If there is an intruder in the building, this is the Department of Homeland Security big thing. Run, hide, fight. I think they followed the KISS acronym. Keep it simple, stupid. Okay? If there is an intruder in your building that doesn't belong, or weapon-related violence, because let's face it, many times the people that commit these acts, they did belong in the building. They just lost it for a minute and decided to do something atrocious. Run, hide, fight. Think. What I stress to all the educators here is just like us and every other human being, what are we capable of doing? We're capable of processing information rather quickly and making the most reasonable and prudent decision we can at the time based on that information. If you hear some violence, some gunfire, and it's down the hall, what's the right thing to do? There's a side door right there, and we hear, you know, there's a, there's a door to our left, and we hear the noise coming from the right. It's time, to, it's time to get out. Big thing is think. Think, think, think. During a stay in place, we just want to stop movement. We're asking our educators to look and listen, take kids from the hallway, even if they don't belong to them, and adopt them for the time being, lock your door, Update your attendance, because we might need to know where students are, depending on how this emergency goes, and keep teaching. Keep the kids calm, explain to them that, you know, there's a problem outside the building, that's why stay in place is in. Sometimes a stay in place would be appropriate in the building, especially in, say, the elementary school age. Imagine, if you would, that there is an adult visiting with the principal, a parent, and unfortunately that parent goes into cardiac arrest, and EMS has to be called. Stay in place is a great thing to be called because now we know no students are going to move around and, you know, no one probably wants to have a small child see that EMS come in and have to put this person on a backboard and get them out to the hospital. And then once the person is on their way with fire and EMS, they can clear the stay in place and everything goes back to normal. Even the teachers themselves don't need to know at the moment why their building's been put in stay in place. 
So run, hide, fight in the event of a lockdown. This is what came to us from the Department of Homeland Security. They say if you're in direct contact, have a clean escape plan, get out. If you're not in direct contact and you hide and you're able to secure your area, that might be your choice. And as a last resort, because let's face it, folks, this is a threat inside the building and it has to start somewhere. What if it starts in the room you're in? As a last resort, you can't run, your life is in danger, you fight. I mean, I hate to say it, but these students and the paid staff, none of them gave up their rights to liberty because they entered the school. You know, these things happen. Um, again, they, teachers need to have the confidence that they're able to make these decisions and they have the support of the administration and the school committee that if they decide to run or if they decide to hide, that they're going to be supported because I cannot tell them in any instance which is the right thing to do. Some people firmly believe if they think they can get out, they can get out. The only thing I offer there is this, especially in some of these bigger schools. You don't know why the school was put in the lockdown, but it was. You don't hear anything. You don't see anything. You don't smell anything. Well, folks, I know we're safe in this room right now. Do we necessarily want to go down the hall and down the stairs and walk right into somebody? We might not. And that's where we get into securing your room. Should you decide to take refuge, what are you doing? You're not doing what first came out. 12, 15 years ago, locking the door and hiding under a desk, right? And we talk about this with the teachers. Are you, especially with, with your older kids, because you can elicit them for help, are you moving furniture in front of the door? Are you taking your belt off or your pocketbook strap and using it to tie off those doorways, the doorknobs, to a, to a hard, solid, fixed object in addition? Are you barricading the door, blockading the door, taking the extension cords off the AV cards? Anything in that room you can use. Even if it means, don't get, me, don't get upset at me, but if it even means damaging a book to make it a wedge that can be jammed under that door, just any way to make it harder for anybody to get in. These are all things people have to think about. And every single teacher should be thinking about their personal plan based on their environment, their classroom, their position in the building, where it's located, what type of resources that they'll have, okay? Obviously, these can cause anxiety. Another reason why I hate to see it used when it shouldn't be used. Uh, kids can be typ typically okay. We ask parents to keep their anxiety and fears to themselves. Their children will obviously feed off their reactions. And if they looked at a positive and don't live in fear, be vigilant. Tell someone if you see something that's not doesn't seem right to you. People apologize to me or members of my staff all the time, and we always have the same answer. We much rather look into something that isn't, then have to respond to something that is because no one said anything. All right? Kids of all ages can respond and have responded well to this. Have an open mind. Be positive. Have confidence in the training. Have confidence in the school system. Uh, they don't need to provide graphic details upon why. And they should support these actions by being cooperative with their school staff, especially at the pick up and drop off, visiting the building. I know sometimes it can be frustrating, you know, signing in. Sometimes you're not the only person looking to visit a teacher. You know, be patient. Um, this day and age, security is, is at a higher level than it was when we were in school. Parents aren't going to be allowed to walk around these buildings freely and look for their child. It, it's just not the way it is today. It's, it's sad, but this is the unfortunate reality of the world we live in. In the event of an incident, Parents, please do not go to the school. You will be turned away. Um, there will be another designated area for you to pick up your child. You'll be reunited as soon as possible. Listen to the radio, news stations, the internet news enterprise, because there will be notifications as to where to go. What will we use? It depends on the day. It depends on the school. I am sorry, no, we cannot tell you what our plans are. Um, you know, there is a reason public safety procedures are exempt from public record. Um, we can't tell people where they can do more damage. The sad part is, is that usually these perpetrators are current students, former students, current employees, former employees, or parents. 
and we asked them to stay off the cell phone. I know everybody's on the phone. We always tell the teachers and schools and I train the kids, please try to get your students not to use the cell phones. Public safety, in an event like this, there's going to be a lot of public safety response. Not all of us can talk on the same radio frequencies, and we do resort to cell phone usage. Should the towers be jammed because everybody wants to try to call somebody about this incident, it, it could ha hamper our ability. Thank you. Yes. To the real situation that we had when Principal Wolder was the principal here mm -hmm. a couple of years ago when uh, that person from out of state was calling and making threats to a whole bunch of different school yes. systems, Brockton being one of them, uh, because the kids were um, uh, the, uh, removed from the school, yes. as you recall. Uh, uh, Shaw's was a big uh, area that the kids had to go to. I mean, so could you just apply that to what we went through? Well, in that instance, that wasn't a threat inside the building um, of ongoing violence, okay? That was a called-in threat uh, a determination was made the building should be evacuated, so it was evacuated. We basically, now keep in mind, the students didn't even make it to class that day. They were all in the cafeterias or in common areas. That was that early in the morning. So they basically told half the building to go to one location, be in the stadium. In the other location, we uh, commandeered the baseball stadium. And from there, as we were starting to come up with re uh, reunification, we realized we're dealing with young adults who often drive themselves to school or walk themselves to school. We can pretty much dismiss them and just make a call at parents that these are kids that could be on their way home. Some parents may not have liked that, or I think that was a good idea, but the truth of the matter was more students were just leaving on their own to get out of Dodge. We're trying to contact kids, uh, but I thought from your perspective, things were pretty well organized in terms of the orderly dismissal of our students. The kids you know. got out great. I mean, and that's the thing people have to remember. There's 4,000 students from freshmen to seniors up in that building. I don't think we had any injuries that I recall. It's a couple years ago now. I don't think we had it. I don't believe, if we did, it was someone sprained their ankle. Uh, there was nothing serious. Everybody got home okay by the, by the time the day was over. Um, I thought it went extremely well. Yes, we had a bunch of parents that did try to come up in in that instance, although I don't recommend it, I'm just gonna be honest, it would be a past incident, it wasn't as problematic as a situation like this. Why? It was a bomb threat. Had that been a bomb that went off, can you see where it would be a lot different if those parents are trying to come? Meanwhile, they're in the way of all the emergency services trying to come in. If you go back and look at some of the camera footage of uh, Newtown, Connecticut, where parents parked on both sides of the road and you had these ambulances trying to get up and you can see they're driving at like 15 miles an hour just trying to maneuver in between the cars that were parked and abandoned for parents to rush up and trust me I'm a father I understand that is a natural natural reaction um, sometimes we have to fight those natural reactions and think about the big picture and you would hate to think that well I'm there for my daughter and it was your car that actually blocked the ambulance that your daughter needed we really have to you know, we have to think about these, we have to plan. Even parents have their own personal plan. There's nothing stopping any of these parents that's telling their kid, if you have to get out of the building and once you're out and you get separated from the teacher, you go here. That's where I'm going to look for you. It's two blocks from the school. If the cell phone towers don't work and I can't even call you, I'm going to come to this location to look for you. But it was a very scary time for, you know, certainly, um, lots of parents who were nervous for their kids. I mean, we had the forum uh, over at South yes. where you addressed you know, parents in terms of uh, explaining to them why certain procedures were followed. And, um, you know, of course, parents at the time were um, naturally concerned and upset that they couldn't, you know, get access to the school right away. And, and, and you, you know, took the time to explain to them and go through the process of, you know, why, just as you just said, um, again, you know, a different set of circumstances than what just happened, but, but you know, planning and organization, um, you know, helped to make that, you know, a, um, 
uh, an unfortunate experience, but uh, a learning experience to uh, improve on. And I thought that it was, you know, overall it was pretty well done. Um, and um, I mean, uh, could you just tell the public how you know you basically learn from that, and then there's debriefings uh, on the whole process of what went on. I mean, after that, you know, there were plenty of meetings about you know those, how, those how it was handled. Plenty, and what plenty to of do. meetings, plenty of conversation. There, nothing is ever going to beat a learning experience of a real event. As much as none of us want a real event to occur, there's no better learning experience than a real event because that's when it really, you, you can see what really took place and then you can start to look at, you know, you'll hear these recommendations, uh, you, you know, there's a recommendation going out there, well, there should be somebody over the PA giving instruction, you, you know, it sounds great until you're in a real world event and there's gunfire being done and you can't communicate with another officer the length of a patrol car because of the noise and you realize now imagine the idea of actually trying to communicate calmly to other people live events give you a good idea in that instance um, <coughs> we had two locations that we could use that were close by weather certainly cooperated presentation excellent Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes. So during a lockdown, parents wouldn't be called at all. During a during a lockdown, if the school goes on a lockdown, parents would not be called. As a matter of fact, the phones wouldn't be answered. Okay. That, I mean, that's so. that's the procedure. During a lockdown, every everybody participates to include the staff. The principal themselves is told. And I do think this is the area we have to get with our drills, because right now we do drills with them, and they are side by side with us. I think moving forward, maybe next school season, we need to get into the where I don't just send one officer to do a drill with the supervisor. I send a couple of officers to do the drill, and everybody participates, because the truth of the matter is, again, learning and learning from real incidents. Do I really want the principals to do that? I don't want to. I don't want to be responsible to drill a principal into a muscle memory that if this happens, they're gonna walk the floor and start checking doors and get themselves possibly killed. And more than that, if they get themselves killed, every principal has what we call keys to the kingdom. All these doors these other teachers are going to lock, they're gonna give up keys to. So I think moving forward, we even with drills have to look at, everybody participates to include the top administrators in that building. So on one hand, we tell them not to answer the phones. On the other, they shouldn't be there to answer the phones. They should be escaping or locking down somewhere. Um, I had a ward meeting last week, and of course this was um, an issue that was being discussed. And I was lucky enough to be able to say that I worked at the high school while you did a training. So I did have some information on that. I was able to say how it isn't just a one-size-fits-all that you do tell the teachers here that they need to make a good judgment call. And that's really what people wanted to hear. So I want to thank you for that, and I'm glad that I had an opportunity to see, this, to see how you um, do these trainings. Um, one concern is, do we do these lockdown drills regularly at all of the schools? Do we have a schedule that we follow? What we've been doing the past couple years is we've been asking the, the schools to do them at least twice a year. And I tell them, if you would like to have a police officer, I mean, I'm happy for them to do them more. I can tell you, you have a couple of schools that they do them, it seems like, almost once a month. Um, but if you want a police officer to be present, you know, try to give me like 48 hours notice. And even when I say, yes, someone will be there, I always throw in the caveat, provided there's no other place they're vitally needed or there's, they're not tied up on something else pressing, uh, we'll send them over there for that drill. And they do stay in place and they do lockdown. Um, you know, I've been pushing them to do more of a stay in place and I have a reason for that rather than the lockdown. Um, it's something I'd like to address moving, moving forward to do more lockdowns, but to do more lockdowns, I, it's going to disrupt the school day just a little bit longer. Okay. So you said that you recommend, usually they do about two a year. Say if, um, would you say that they should do a stay in place a certain amount of times a year and that a lockdown would just twice a year would be um, sufficient? Uh, you can never, 
It, it, well, it has to be reasonable. You know, you, you can never, you know, there are some people in the training world, you can never not train enough, and that is certainly valid. But on the same token, you don't, you don't want to push it. Um, a big part of this lockdown, again, it doesn't go into the parent form, but it goes in with the teachers and it goes in with the students. If the school's placed in lockdown, you know, stay in place is one thing. Listen to the PA, it's, it's all clear. In a lockdown, there is no all clear. A lockdown being cleared is face to face. Me and you, the administrator, going door to door to, and, and taking them out of the lockdown. Um, you, you want to remain real. You want to be real and you want to be meaningful. Certainly never want to turn these drills into the car alarm. Let's face it, you're walking across the parking lot from the supermarket, no one cares that the car alarm's going off. You want this to stay relevant. So a few a year would, would be great. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to overburden something. You don't want to panic people. Um, it's just something that should be, people should be very mindset of. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. just um, the superintendent will be sending out an invitation. Um, the superintendent, the mayor's office, um, the Brockton Police Department, and the fire department are sponsoring um, the community forum on school safety, which is on um, Tuesday, March 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. here at Brockton High School in the auditorium. Lieutenant Mills will be running the, um, uh, the uh, parent um, training for them. Um, and the mayor will be there along with the, uh, the police chief um, to also fire. talk, and the fire chief to talk about public safety as well and safety in the schools and the city's commitment to, and the school committee's commitment to, um, everybody has the invitation, yep. um, obviously to school safety, which is our top priority. So again, that is on Tuesday, March 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the Broughton High School Auditorium, and we invite all parents and community members to come, um, and they'll see um, Lieutenant Mills' presentation and also be able to uh, ask um, questions about school safety and, and other things that are, that we're going to do. We're also going to cover some social media um, pitfalls that parents can help us with and, and look out for with their, um, with their students. So um, I think it's going to be a very um, informative session and forum, and uh, we hope that as many people come as possible. I think it's going to be great um, and obviously very important. And leading into that, I wanted to talk a little bit um, and Sharma spoke about this, about the, the, um, the March 14th, next Wednesday, is um, one month after the horrific um, shooting in Parkland, Florida. Um, with the um, teachers, um, I know Superintendent Smith has uh, met with um, Kim Gibson, president of the BEA, and between the teachers and the students, uh, each school is planning their own way to honor the 17 victims of that uh, of that shooting on the um, on March 14th, which is next Wednesday, I know up here at the high school, Dr. Murray talked about what they're going to do at one o'clock. Um, but every school is planning their own um, way to honor the victims. And again, it's in, with cooperation with the students, with the BEA, with all the staff members. Uh, so each school school will be doing something different, obviously, and something age appropriate for elementary, middle school, and high school. So again, that is um, next, Wednesday, next Wednesday, March 14th, in honor of the victims of the Parkland, Florida school shooting. So, and the superintendent will be sending you um, some examples of what's going on at each, uh, some of the schools in Friday's packet. Um, and then, I don't know if I'm, am I out of, out of order here with the agenda? And, I, and then, um, I want to thank the mayor, the, B, the DPW, the fire department, the police department for the help that they gave to the school system over the last um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and yesterday. So basically over a four-day stretch of um, that horrible event we had for weather in the nor'easter, uh, historic nor'easter, where, it, where we obviously hit hurricane force winds. Um, and we came out of it actually um, with our schools remarkably well. Um, I know power was down for a while, but I spent a lot, of, a lot of time on the phone with the mayor who was on the phone with probably 25 other people at the time. So I appreciate his time uh, and his efforts to do whatever he could. And it was kind of a miracle that we were back in school today um, with the damage and 
but I know that um, the mayor has national grid on speed dials, so the pressure that he puts on them um, is amazing how much work that he um, gets them to do in Brockton and how quickly he gets them here. So I also want to thank the um, Ken Thompson uh, and the, the facilities department, the custodians, the craftsmen. Um, again, we have older buildings, and um, they, again, they came out. We had some water coming. We had it coming in through the brick. That's how heavy the rain and wind was. It was coming right through the walls. So um, again, this is something that comes not too often. So I just want to thank the mayor and his staff and the hard work that they did to ensure that we could get back to school today. Thank you. I would appreciate it. We had a great team effort over the weekend. First responders, police, fire, EMS. DPW played a huge role. Uh, schools. We did have issues at a few of the schools. I think we probably could have got open for Monday, and our concerns weren't as much immediately directly with the schools as our concerns were more about conditions for the students getting back and forth to school with a lot of key traffic lights out, still storm debris along the sides of a lot of the roads. We thought an extra 24 hours, the city would be a lot safer, and I think it was the right call. And uh, we've got some more weather coming tomorrow, so we'll figure it all out again. But uh, we are at this point less than 100 uh, customers in Brockton without power, down from 13,000 on Saturday. So it's taken a few days, but we got the and amazing the, storm. And they did try to co they covered all the bases. I mean, I was on the phone with uh, Larry Rowley, um, and he was even up until yesterday um, clearing bus stops. As you know, we have over 370 bus stops across the city, and. Uh, Larry goes through that list and makes sure that uh, it was, the bus stops were free of debris and branches, and so that's uh, that's how hard they were working, which yeah, is amazing. Yeah, uh, say Brockton Emergency Management Agency also was uh, extremely involved. Yeah, we actually did. Yeah, we had to get the school routes and had people out physically checking the school routes to make sure that there weren't uh, obstacles and wires down or trees down, things like that. Crazy storm. That's it for me. That's Mayor. it for you? Yes. Sure that's it now, huh? It's only been an hour and a half. Yeah. Okay. Hour and 50 minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, so we'll go back to the agenda under unfinished, oh no, I'm sorry, items to refer to subcommittees. Do any members of the committee have an item that they would uh, like the superintendent to refer to a subcommittee? No, seeing none, I think we have enough subcommittee meetings scheduled already. Uh, unfinished business, we don't have any list listed on the agenda. All right, so we'll go to new business. And for the members of the committee, I'll direct your attention to enclosure number 18 towards the back of the book. And uh, this is a state disclosure form. It's a uh, conflict of interest disclosure uh, that's been submitted by Deputy Superintendent Thomas uh, that seeking the, I think the best way for me to word it would be the school committee's authorization for him to participate uh, on the negotiating team with the BEA. He has a family member who's a member of the BEA and he's disclosing that publicly and has filed the form and the school committee has the option to authorize him to continue in that role on the negotiating team or we have the option to determine that he's conflicted to the point that he might not be able to execute his duties properly. Um, these are pretty common forms. I just had to file one recently when we were in negotiations with the police department because I have a family member that's a police officer. Um, it's a pretty routine disclosure, but it's important in terms of the public's right to know uh, that there is a potential conflict. My own personal take on this for what it's worth the BEA is a very large. Kim, how many members do you have of the BEA? Okay, 1,277 members. I don't believe that anything's going to happen in negotiations that would benefit one individual member of that 1,277 any more than it would benefit any of the others. Um, and I'm comfortable with Mr. Thomas to fill that role, but uh, I'll open up the floor for any discussions, questions, or comments. Mr. D'Agostino. I'm also comfortable with Deputy Superintendent filling this role. Um, great point that you made, but also 
um, I'm comfortable enough with his integrity that he wouldn't let his personal, you know, uh, uh, conflicts interfere with his job duties. Okay. Ms. Plant? I'd also like to speak out in support of Mr. Thomas. Um, we've gotten to know you pretty well since our time on this committee, and I think you always make the decision that is best. And um, I absolutely trust your judgment in this. Okay. If everybody's good, we'll entertain a motion. I guess the motion would be, Tom, you can help me with this a little bit, to accept the disclosure and authorize Mr. Thomas to be a member of the bargaining unit? As a member of the bargaining, bargaining unit, unit. Yeah. Okay. So I'll make that motion. Okay, so the motion's on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. Made properly second. All in favor? Unanimous. Wonder, would you please have the record indicate that I cast a vote also? Okay. So we're going to go. One more item. I, was, I haven't said the. Oh, yep, I have one too, but go right ahead, Mr. Minchell. Made by our um, trustee CFO uh, that um, with regard to finances, that uh, there's a request to uh, close the budget at this time. Um, so I'll just read to you a uh, motion that I'm going to put on the table. Uh, in an effort to conserve funds to help supplement the FY19 budget, uh, we'd like to close, uh, make a motion to close the FY18 budget to any discretionary spending effective uh, March 7, 2018. Uh, not to say that uh, <coughs> principles or uh, requested monies can't be made, but they would have to go through um, the CFO, the deputy superintendent, and the superintendent uh, before they are approved. And that is something that we is commonplace, and we pretty much do it at this time every year. Uh, there's approximately four months left to, um, you know, between now and June. So, um, so I'll make that motion. Okay. Second. Motion's on the table. Is there a second? second? Okay. Any discussion on the motion? Not all in favor? Opposed? Okay. Um, I'll just give this to Ms. Al so okay. she has the language. Uh, so, anyone else for new business? Yep, go right ahead, Mr. Gormley. But, uh, in Ward 4, we're having a Ward 4 meeting um, March 14th at the Emmanuel House at 6.30. Uh, I'll be speaking, and Officer Mosley, who was in the building, uh, will be speaking as well. So if you're a Ward 4 resident, we'd love to see you there at the Emanuel House and come and meet myself, Ms. Nicastro, and Officer Mosley, our own Officer Mosley. You'll be talking football or what do we be Yeah, uh, Officer Mosley and I are going to go over the benefits <laughs> of the 3-4 defense <laughs> yeah. and the cover two. <laughs> um, great, thank you. March 14th, 6.30, Emanuel House for a Ward 4 meeting that will include Mr. Gormley. And uh, I, I just want to uh, mention that uh, we're pleased to announce that uh, we've got some green community uh, grant money for the school department to put into some of the buildings. So uh, over the last, it's probably sad, two and a half years ago, Brockton was able to earn green community status with the state very lengthy process. The school department was a partner with us in that, along with a number of other city departments. Uh, it's opened the doors to some grant opportunities. The LED light program that's going on right now received a grant of over half a million dollars that was only available to green communities. Uh, and so this grant uh, is for a little over half a million dollars, and that's uh, to do a variety of work and repairs on 10 different schools. So. It's grant, it's, there's no match, the work is already planned. The school department actually had to propose the work that would be done with the money to get the grant. It's part of a larger block of money that we're getting. Um, but during these extremely tough fiscal times, uh, it was a great opportunity for us to be able to put some money back into some of the facilities uh, without having to use our local dollars. So we're uh, very appreciative of getting that grant money from the from the state, and uh, I want to thank also Ken Thompson, who was very instrumental in helping us uh, get that grant. Anyone else? Joyce. I just wanted to um, thank the Brookfield School, Principal Masson, and 
uh, the Barrett Russell Principal Camillo for inviting me to um, read, read Across America on Friday. Um, a few of my colleagues, we, we were all over the schools reading. Um, so I just want to say thank you. That's always a fun day, uh, is celebrating with the students and being hands-on with the students in the classrooms and um, just, just sitting there and getting to know them. That's one of my favorite days. And I know I met up with um, Ms. Plant and Mr. Sullivan um, as we were passing at schools. But no, thank you. Um, it's a fun day, every year. Can you tell us what school you write in, Tom? Or? Okay. All right. um, I was wondering um, if we could uh, invite um, Mr. Turner and the Empower Yourself um, group uh, and recognize them for their um, accomplishment, uh, the, uh, the success they had at the Global Economic Summit over at uh, UMass Boston uh, three weeks ago? Approximately three weeks, three, three weeks ago. Um, we can talk to the superintendent about timing, but um, could you make a note of that? I think that would be a great idea. Yeah. They did very well over there. Yeah. Anyone else? Looks like the boys are going to win the tournament game tonight, so that was a south semi. You've been uh, checking scores during the meeting? That's what I've been doing. I've been getting about <laughs> four different people texting me the scores. <laughs> um, but it looks like they're going to move on. about that electronic device policy again. Yeah. It's in public <laughs> record, right? Uh, <laughs> but the boys are going to move on. They'll play UMass uh, awesome. probably awesome. Saturday. Awesome. So that's always a great game. Uh, I know you've been there. So it's, it's a great Saturday. It Do is. you want to mention the uh, human knowledge with the members of the track team that are going off to the next competition? Uh, that's it, actually. Uh, there's a few guys going to Nationals. To I'm, not Nationals sure, yeah. I'm not sure exactly who's going, so I didn't okay. want to All say right. it. Well, I was actually going to go. but <laughs> No, they're, they're coming to see me at City Hall at the end of the week, but I can't rattle off the names. Yeah, I think I'm, we have five going off to the Nationals. Yeah, I'm not, not sure off the top of my head who's going because some, there were some changes during the All-State meet to relay teams and things like that. We'll, so. we'll report on that at the next meeting. Yeah, then. but Cole, uh, Cole Wyman, three-time All-State champion, Wrestling. And wrestling, we didn't mention that actually. First one uh, congratulations front. to him. First run in the history of the city. Uh, so hats off to him. Yep, city of champions. That's right. Maybe you could speak to Mr. Cairo about um, um, inviting him here because that is an incredible accomplishment. It is. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. That we could bring them both in for yeah, the same. That would be great. Is that next meeting? Yeah, 20th. Yeah, yep. good idea. We'll do that. Wasn't there another wrestler? Um, was it the last name? Win? Win? Or can you talk to Can you talk to Mr. Carroll? I think there's another wrestler that that, that achieved yep. a really uh, high uh, honor recently. Bruno San Martino. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sergeant Slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Michelle is going to start giving us smackdown results now. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chief J. Strongbow. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think it's getting a little silly here. Time to wrap it up. Anyone get any, anyone else for new business? All right, how about a motion to adjourn? I think we desperately need one. Motion to adjourn. Motion's made. Second. All in favor? Meeting's adjourned. Thank you very much.